Good evening, Lakers. How are you? It's so good to see you. I'm just going to give a, about another 30 seconds um, for our families to get situated and logged in, and then we will go ahead and get started. So just give us a couple minutes. We're just uh, helping people get signed in and making sure that they're all set, and then we'll begin with this evening. Right. I think we're set to start, so grab some popcorn and a fun treat. Um, just to let you know, it's going to take roughly an hour and a half start to finish, um, maybe a little less to go through our plan. Um, and tonight, it's really our goal to be able to share with you the reopening plan for the fall for our Lakers. Um, we're going to talk about the health side of the plan and, and what um, what measures we're putting in place on the health side, and then we're also going to spend some time talking about um, instructional opportunities. So this has really obviously been, been new waters for us, but I'm extremely excited about what we have to offer um, our families and students here at Danbury. Really, today and, and this presentation is not possible without a ton of time and effort from our administrators, um, from our staff, uh, from some community members, as well as medical professionals um, who have taken time to advise in all pieces of this. As I present the plan this evening, I want to let you know that um, our plan has line by line been reviewed by the Ottawa County Health Department, as well as our legal team. So just really trying to cover all of our bases. As we begin tonight, I would tell you that the safety of our students, of our family, of our community, and of our staff is really at the forefront of what drives our decisions. Um, you know, I think one thing that I want to remind each and every one of us is that during this time, we have individuals that are all over the spectrum. You have some that are down here that are um, have very specific concern about the virus and, and have specific feelings about how they feel the virus should be treated and handled. And then you have people that are on the very opposite end of the spectrum that have very specific opinions about um, why they're not fearful of the virus and maybe why they shouldn't wear masks. And then you have everybody that's in between. And so really my goal and the goal of our staff um, in this district is throughout this process and whatever may come our way is to always um, respect one another's uh, viewpoints, to treat each other um, with respect and love, to be humble, to be kind, to be graceful, to show empathy, to be supportive, and really just do the very best that we can to journey through this together. Now, I know for some people they view this as doom and gloom. Um, for some people they view this as this could be our darkest hour. I choose today to take a different perspective as the leader of Danbury Schools. I believe quite opposite. I believe that this potentially could be our finest hour. We have an opportunity to be creative, to, be creative, to think outside of the box, to reconnect, to reconnect and, reinvent and reinvent what we do, and ultimately, and ultimately to, make to make the educational experiences and opportunities for our students, for our students even better than they were before. Than they were before. And I think if and we collectively work together, we have, we the have the opportunity to change history. To change history. I found this I found video this clip, video clip when, I uh, when I was a young girl. One of my favorite movies was Apollo, was Apollo 13. And I just want you to watch this clip. And, 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 and in part of this video, this is really, this is really a, trying a trying time when, when, the, when astronauts the astronauts up in space have been delivered. Have been delivered terrible news. Um, and I want you to watch how these two leaders respond to the news that, um, that they've just delivered to their, air, their astronauts.
Roger, let's tie all the batteries on a main A and main B. Flight, they're still shallowing a bit up there. Do you want to tell them? Is there anything we could do about it? Not now, Flight. And they don't need to know, do they? Copy that. Is my phone still a presence in this platform? Yeah. Parachute situation, the heat shield, the angle of trajectory in the typhoon. There's just so many variables. I'm a little I know what lost. the problems are, Henry. This could be the worst disaster NASA's ever experienced. With all due respect, sir, I believe this is going to be our finest hour. This is going to be our finest hour. I believe we have the best students, the best staff, and the best community. And I'm excited to rally together and deliver the very best for our kids. As we move forward, I want you to know that we continue to be grounded on our mission statement and in our core values and really keep that apart and at the center of our decision making and how we conduct education moving forward. So let's talk about what are, what are our options going to be. So just so you know, as, as you start to think about what fall could look like. The first option is what I like to call our family option. This is the option, if you select this option, that really resembles school as we once knew it. Um, this is where our students are coming back into um, somewhat of a traditional Danbury school environment. Um, option two is, is our home-based model. This is going to be an opportunity for students to learn from home, but yet be taught by our staff and be a part of the day-to-day -day instruction from start to finish with our faculty. This gives our kids the opportunity to learn from home and yet virtually be in our classrooms all day, every day. And then option three, this is what we call our customized learning plan. Uh, we know that every family's dynamics are different. Every student's needs are different. And so maybe for you right now, option one, our family model, or option two, our home-based model, that doesn't seem to be maybe what you want. We have other opportunities through our district being enrolled as our student that we're going to be able to sit with you and your family and really talk about what those options look like and which one would be best for you. And our goal is no matter what option you choose, option one, option two, or option three, our goal is to keep you connected to our Danbury family and to help you in any way possible to help to deliver the best educational experiences and opportunities to your child. So I'm going to talk more specifically about what these look like um, here in a little bit, but I just wanted you to know kind of that overview. Also, the one thing that we're really keeping in mind as we look at these different models and as we look at our priorities, um, in specific as we look at option one, bringing our kids back to school and back into the environment that they once knew. So our priorities are, are being flexible, being relational, um, obviously, safety is at the forefront of everything that we'll be doing here while at school. Um, we believe that face-to-face -face interaction is critical, but also really taking a close look at quality instruction. And that's really why we want to keep you engaged with our staff. We believe that we have the highest level of quality instruction. And so keeping you immersed in that is really at the benefit of your child. And that's important to us. Um, now, I did take time in, and we did define these for you, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to read word through word um, through each one of these, but as you, as you have an opportunity to sit back and take a look at the slideshow on your time, you'll be able to read what each one of those kind of means from our perspective, just so that we're all on the same page about what those priorities mean. Um, the next one is really getting into what is going to be our reopening agreement. And, and there's some information on there, but I think the part for me that's most important to share out to you is that our goal is to approach this purposefully, strategically, and intentionally. 
And the documents that are collected um, were an effort of administrators, educators, and health professionals. And, and the, the goal was really to create an educational uh, plan that supports learning and student health and wellness. That was really at the forefront of our priorities. So let's talk a little bit about the safety end of things. Because I know a lot of parents are really trying to decide, do I want to send my child back to Danbury? Do I want to potentially go remote? If so, what, that, what does that look like? And I think before we can really make those decisions, we've got to take a step back and really look at what are the safety protocols that are going to be put in place here. And here's what I would ask you, um, and this might be difficult. I'm going to ask you to just, just take a breath for a minute. There's so much information that bombards us every single day, whether it's the news or whether it's social media. Um, and we have a lot of preconceived opinions and ideas. And I just want us to pause for a moment. And I want you to know as your leader that as I sat with our teams and put together our plans and really specifically keyed in on the health side, that I wore several hats as I facilitate those conversations. I was thinking from the perspective of Carrie the superintendent, from the perspective of Carrie the principal, Carrie the teacher, and Carrie the mom. For many of you, I'm a parent like you are. I have children at all levels, from elementary, through high school, through college, that are involved in this, in this uh, pandemic. And so for me, it was really important in, in whatever decision we made, how would I feel about that as a mom? And as we talked about these safety protocols, I thought to myself, if this were my own child, what would I want done? And so as you compare our plan to maybe the plans of other districts, you might find our plan is more specific or our plan has more safety protocols in it than other districts. Um, and for us, we just really wanted to be Danbury. We really wanted to be able to offer the highest level of safety to our students. So take a breath. Give us a chance now to explain to you what it's going to look like to return back to school for our Danbury staff and students. Let's talk about transportation and busing. Our drivers will have the option to wear a mask while they're on that bus. Um, we're going to make sure that no student sits directly behind the driver. We want there to be that, that distance between the driver and the students. We are going to ask that as soon as the students load the bus, their mask be in place and that they hand sanitize. In addition, that we're going to ask that, a students, that, that students be assigned to specific seats. Actually, this is something that's always done, but I know sometimes parents don't know that, so I wanted to make sure that we put into our slides things that maybe already happened, but maybe you don't know. So students will be given an assigned seat. They'll be sitting with their sibling. I think when all possible, keeping our families together is important. There will be specific procedures that we will utilize as we load and unload the bus. Like for an example, when our students get on the bus, they will get on the bus and move all the way to the back of the bus and then fill forward as students board the bus. Um, we'll ask that the drivers dismiss each student or each seat when, we, when they get to the building. You know, students, it's hard for them to remember to social distance. They're excited and they want to get off the bus and they want to get in school. But we want to make sure that we take that extra step and make sure that they're social distancing as they, as they leave the bus. So it kind of reminds me of like a wedding reception or we finish out a wedding and we're dismissing by pews. That's essentially what I'm going to ask the drivers to do is dismiss by seat as the students exit the bus. For our students, grades K through 12, we are going to ask that they be masked while on the bus. Um, this is because they're sitting within close proximity of each other, and we know that that mask provides um, the most protective barrier as possible, not only for the student, but also for everyone else on the bus. Um, in addition, I just want you to know that as we get closer to school, I will be sitting with our drivers, um, again, going through very specific protocols and cleaning things and, and other measures that will be put into place so that everyone is aware and on the same page of, of what those transportation ex expectations look like. Let's talk about coming into the building. We're going to require mandatory temperature checks for everyone that enters the building. This is staff, 
this is students, this is sub-employees. And so the, we have purchased thermal imaging cameras, or thermal imaging temperature check stations, and we will have those at four main entrances within our district. We're going to have a, a thermal reader, reader at the high school board office entrance. We're going to have one at the elementary entrance. We're going to have one at the middle school entrance and also two in the athletic lobby entrance. And basically, the, when students come through these thermal readers, it takes a temperature one every second. Now, if by some chance a, a staff member or a student reads above 100.4, we may hold them for a second and use a, semp a another temperature check, a handheld temperature check, maybe on their wrist, just to do a double check on where their fever is at if, if they still have one. For our, our students that are involved in early care programs or our preschool, we will have handheld thermometers for those entrances, for those individuals. Um, students who have a temperature or staff or sub-employee who has a temperature of 100.4 or higher, that will result in directing the individual to the isolated room that we have identified, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, um, and we will go through what those next steps will be with those individuals. We're going to ask that students in grades 5 through 12 that are being dropped off in the morning, we're going to ask that those students come through the high school entrance. Again, just doing, trying to utilize all those little details to social distance our kids and space out uh, mass gatherings by getting them to go through different entrances. And then obviously that eases um, the pace in which we can move through those thermal thermometers. Once students come into the building, we will have hand sanitizer available. We're going to ask that they um, hand sanitize as they come to the building. And, and just so you know, at every entrance, and as well as high traffic areas, as well as our classrooms, we will have hand sanitation available for our students. What we know, speaking of hand sanitation, what we know is one of the best ways to help protect our students and staff is not only by masking, but hand washing. And so we're going to spend quite a bit of time teaching, reminding, and encouraging frequent hand washing. While hand sanitation is good, health department tells us hand washing is even better. And so we're going to spend some time teaching the techniques, the proper techniques of how to hand wash, and really asking our staff to help us build in time for our students to hand wash. We will have, like I said, hand sanitizing. Um, available in our high traffic areas, in our entrances, and in our classrooms. Let's talk about the classroom in specific. Classrooms at this point are going to operate at normal capacity. We're going to utilize the maximum amount of space available in the classroom while maximizing safety precautions. You know, we're so lucky here at Danbury because our class sizes are significantly on a day-to-day -day basis than most districts. So when you hear other districts talking about a hybrid model or they're looking at starting in a hybrid model, which is uh, meaning that they're, they're dividing their students into groups um, and reducing capacity by 50%, maybe sending one group on one day and the next group on the other day. That's because those districts are trying to get to the class capacity that we're already at. So we're really fortunate at Danbury that, that we can already maximize our classroom space without having to reduce capacity. And for us, it's just super important to get our kids here all day, every day. Um, at this point, based on our current enrollment, and this is assuming, this would be assuming that, that no students would be going remote learning, that every student would be coming back on the first day of school, September 8th, um, Right now, we have it set that our classroom will be spaced five feet by five feet. That means we have five feet in front, five feet behind, and five feet on both sides um, of our students. That's the, the health department is suggesting social distancing in classrooms anywhere from three to six feet. And so right now, we're at five feet by five feet. Now, if we have pockets of kids that decide to go to remote learning, which means those classrooms that have students in them um, now become smaller, we may have the ability to stretch even further than five feet. We might be six or seven feet apart. And, and just know that if we have the capability to do that, we absolutely want to make sure that we do that. At this time, elementary um, special teachers, art, music, phys ed, library, right now we've built their schedules so that we can disinfect in between 
each classroom that's moving to that space. Um, and so at this time, we're going to allow those students to travel to their specials classroom. Now, if we notice that there's um, an uptick or a rise in cases, then the health department may advise that uh, they advise us not to create so much movement. And if that's the case, then we would keep the students in their classroom and those specials would come to each classroom and to deliver the special that way. But at this point, we feel that it's okay for our students to visit um, each of those special spaces. In the elementary, I know that we have some teachers who switch classrooms to deliver instruction. So for right now, we're gonna ask that the students remain in their classroom and that the teachers switch. And again, that's just in the elementary. Now, when you talk about middle school and high school, we're going to run a normal switch like we always do where students will move classroom to classroom and, and the teacher will stay put. And I'm going to talk about some of the safety protocols that we're going to put in place because we're going to do that. Um, but that's how, that's how our classrooms are going to be set up. I did take a picture for you so you could see, as of right now, this would be an example of classrooms that are spaced five feet by five feet. So if you look on your screen, you'll see that there's an example of a high, a high school classroom, and then you'll notice that there's an example of an elementary classroom. Now for the time being, I'm not sure that in an elementary classroom, there's gonna be a lot of time for kids to be on the carpet or at our kidney tables, um, because again, we wanna make sure that at all times, we're maximizing that social distancing um, to the best of our ability. But I wanted to give you a visual so that you had a bird's eye glance at what it looks like in the classroom. Masking. This has been a hot topic across the state. And you know as well as I do, everyone has an opinion on masking. As you know, the governor has mandated now his mask order. Um, and schools have specific orders that we have to follow. The governor mandated that staff be masked, and he uh, recommended that students third grade through 12 be masked. There's a lot, um, there's a lot of challenges that come with masking, especially as we talk about younger students, especially as we talk about students being asked to wear a mask for seven and a half hours a day. Um, and so we really spent a lot of time on masking. And for, for us as a district, it was really looking at the safety of the mask and, and the protection that it provides, not only to each student, um, but also to each other as we interact. And so we've been on the search, really looking for an ideal situation um, for our students where they have the protection of the mask, but maybe they aren't in a mask all day long. And so I'm really excited. This is something that um, uh, we, we have not only had approved by the Ottawa County Health Department, but it's something that's also been approved by the Ohio Health, Ohio Department of Health. So just know as, just, just for your own information, as schools are making decisions on the health side of things, our first go-to is the health department. That's who we meet with. And in each school, each county meets with their own health department. And so that's why you might find differences on schools' um, health sides. It's because we're each working with different health directors. So our first protocol is to the health department. If they're unsure, they feel like they need further clarification, their next chain up is the Ohio Department of Health. For us, this was so important that not only did we get the okay from the Ottawa County Health Department, we also were cleared by the Ohio Department of Health. So let's talk about what this looks like. All staff, um, as the governor's order, all staff will be required to be masked. We also have face shields that have been approved by the Ottawa County Health Department. They will also be provided a polycarbonate dust shield. But our staff will have some sort of barrier at all times. Our students grades K through 12 will wear mask while they're on the bus, and they will wear mask when they're in the hallways. I'm gonna explain a little later why that masking was so important. Um, once students are securely at their seat and they're behind their polycarbonate shield, the student will then have the choice of whether or not they want to leave their mask in place or if they want to remove their mask and have a break from their mask. And parents, I'm just gonna ask that you have a conversation with your child about what you feel comfortable with. 
If you're like, you know, Carrie, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how I feel about that shield. That's okay. Ask your students to have their mask on. Um, we're going to ask that the students come up into the shield um, as, as so that they can ensure their highest level of protection. Now you'll notice on the slide, we have two different shields. The one shield with the little boy behind it, that's the shield for our preschool through elementary. Those shields are stationary and, and they stay put with that, with your child all day long. Now, I know that um, sometimes kids want to come out from their shield or they want to sit sideways. I mean, that's going to take some effort on our staff to really teach our children the importance of staying in that shield and how that shield acts as a barrier and protects them like a mask. But listen, if the kids want to rock and they want to move and they want to resituate themselves, they can. We're just going to ask that they reapply their mask when they need to do that. At the end of each day, when our custodial staff comes through and cleans our buildings, they will clean these polycarbonate shields so that when the students come in each day and they're sitting behind their shield that's at their desk for them, they'll be sitting behind the shield that's been cleaned. Okay, so I know what you're thinking, okay, well, what do we do then with students who switch classes? Well, obviously, we can't leave shields stationary and have them clean in between every single classroom. So you'll notice on the other side of the screen, what we, what we purchased um, was a polycarbonate shield that was more like a trifold. So what will happen is class gets ready to end. We're going to ask that the students put their mask on, unless, of course, it's already on. We're going to ask that they fold up their shield. We're going to ask that they step back away from their desk and pick up their materials. The teachers will walk by and we'll, we'll spray the um, approved solution on their desk. Students will wipe their desk with a paper towel and then they'll step away from their desk so that that desk is freshly sanitized for the next group of students that are coming in. They're, they will carry that shield with them to the next class. That will be their shield, it will have their name on it, it will stay with them all day long. And so then when they get to the next class and they sit down, they will open their shield pull out their materials, and then at that point they will have the opportunity to either leave their mask in place or pull their mask down and have that mask break. Now, some students, depending on what class they're in, depending upon what materials they might be using, they might say, you know what, I don't have enough room for my shield and my Chromebook and my notebook and my calculator. I feel restricted. I want to come out of my shield. That's fine. We're just going to ask that they put on their mask they can fold up their shields, and they can conduct class like they normally would. At the end of the day, we're going to ask that the students return their shields to their first period class. We'll have those shields cleaned, and then they will be available for pickup um, when they enter their first period class the next day. And again, really, the purpose of the shield was to give kids the opportunity to take a break from their mask, or if you're a parent that says, I want my kid masks for seven hours a day, then you know that there's only pockets of time that will be required for your child to be in a mask. And that that shield, uh, per the um, Ohio Department of Health, that shield serves as the same type of protection as their mask. But again, that's a conversation I'm going to encourage you to have with your child in terms of how you want to utilize that shield. Um, and, and, and if you have questions, obviously reach out to me and, and we can talk about that. As we talk a little bit about cafeteria, and I, I want to mention it here in case I forget to mention it later on, for our students that are traveling to the cafeteria who have these portable shields, we're going to ask that they take their shields with them. They'll have their mask as they go through and get their food, but when they sit down at the table and they're six feet apart, we're going to ask that they put their shield up. That way, the mask comes down, they still have the protective barrier of that shield. Again, just doing whatever we can at all costs to try to ensure maximum safety for our students. Now, I recognize, and I'm going to be honest, coming back to school doesn't mean there's zero risk. Of course, there is a minimal risk coming back. But I just want you to know, um, as your superintendent, as our staff, we're really wanting to do everything in our power to minimize that risk and put safety at the forefront of what we're doing as we're beginning that educational process. Let's talk about the logistics of the hallway. Um, in grades 7 through 12, one of the things that we're going to do is we're really going to help our students to social distance in the hallway. A couple ways we're going to do that. 
we're going to utilize all of our lockers. We're really going to spread kids out so they don't have a locker right next to the person. Um, the other thing that we're going to do is we're going to um, set it where our class changes are going to take six minutes. So for the first three minutes of a bell change, it will be the ladies that will be switching and moving their way to the next classroom. The second three minutes, we'll have our gentlemen in the hallway switching. Again, just doing our best to try to social distance kids and to minimize that mass gathering of kids in the hallway. And as I stated before, when our students in the, are in the hallway, we're going to ask that they have their mask on as they move from class to class. Let's talk about the cafeteria. Currently, our cafeteria seats about 200 at one time. We want to make sure that we social distance our kids as much as possible. There's a lot of details that go in with the cafeteria because, as you know, very different serving a meal to a kindergartner and a first grader versus a junior and a senior in high school. So as you'll notice here, um, we've split our students up um, by grade level. Some will eat in the cafeteria, some will eat in the athletic lobby. And I know what you're thinking, wait a minute, they have round tables in the athletic lobby. Those aren't six feet apart. We're not gonna use those. Um, we're gonna pull out uh, eight foot tables. They will be marked six feet apart. Um, as well as our cafeteria tables in, uh, in our cafeteria, there will be little anchors, a little logo, so that kids know where they can sit because everything will be pre-measured um, to ensure that we're maximizing that maximum distance that we want between kids. Uh, breakfast and lunches, those will be pre-packaged. We won't be able to have our kids have self-serve. You know, last year our kids had a fruit and, and veggie bar and they could self-serve. We're not going to be able to do that right now. A lot of our things will be prepackaged. Our hot me our hot meals, because we think it's super important that our kids have that hot, healthy meal, those will already be pre-trade for our kids, and they're just going to be taking those. Um, they won't be using their keypad anymore. We want to eliminate that, that touch. So they'll either be providing their number to the cashier, or they'll be giving their name. Now, I had one parent say, oh my gosh, but what happens if the student behind hears my daughter's number and they start using her account and all of our money disappears? I can reassure you that won't happen. Every lunch account um, has the student's picture on the screen, so you can very easily see that the student would be trying to use the wrong number. And so I can assure you that that, that won't happen. Um, we'll have additional protective barriers in place for our staff. And our food service staff will be masked and gloved at all time while they're preparing food and while they're serving food. Um, so again, really just want to give the opportunity for our students to receive those hot meals. Now, let's talk a little bit about breakfast. In the past, let's talk about elementary kids. They would come in in the morning off the bus, and they would all gather in the cafeteria, and this would be the time in which they would also be served breakfast. We aren't going to be able to do that. We can't mass gather our kids um, in the cafeteria anymore. So when they come off the bus and they come through the thermal jack and they hand sanitize, they're going to report directly to their classrooms. From there, we'll take attendance and we'll dismiss them to the cafeteria for breakfast. And the same kind of function will happen for high school. So um, really going to have to work with our kids to kind of reteach some of those routines that are going to be a little bit different when they return because of the safety precautions, precautions that we're trying to take. So um, that's kind of how we're handling the, the cafeteria. Clean the classrooms. You know, we are so fortunate, and I noticed this right away my first year as superintendent here. Our custodial staff on a daily basis goes above and beyond what most school districts can do. Um, and so when you heard other districts talk about needing to close down for a day or they're going to they're gonna leave one day where all kids go remote instruction so that the, the custodial staff can deep clean, we already do that on a daily basis. We're really fortunate at what we have set up and, and the incredible staff that we have and the pride that they take in making sure our buildings are clean. Um, so I just listed for you some of the highlighted things that happen every day. Obviously, some of these things, um, I couldn't possibly list everything that they do every day, but I wanted to, to make sure that I put in writing some of the main things that I thought would be important as a parent that I would want to know, such as you know disinfecting all hard surfaces, wiping down all of the seats and desktops and keyboards every day, 
um, disinfecting the uh, polycarbonate shields, the door handles, the drinking fountains, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Speaking of drinking fountains, we have drinking fountains that students have the option to either drink directly from the fountain or use the water bottle feature. At this point in time, I feel it's safest that we use the water bottle feature because you know how little kids are sometimes. Sometimes they get their mouth just a little too close to where that water comes out. And so that makes us nervous. And so we are gonna have or provide for our students a water bottle and they will be able to use their own water bottle every single day and refill that water bottle um, and keep that with them. So I just wanted to touch on drinking fountains. Recess. Recess is the hardest one to really work with. This is the one that, I, that we spent a lot of time with the health department on. Obviously, getting kids outside, allowing them to run and play is really important. But we need to make sure that when we're out for recess, um, that we're still practicing some of those, those best practices, social distancing. Um, we are gonna allow the kids to remove their mask at that time and, and let them play because they're outside. We're gonna have targeted activities that they're gonna be able to do that are safe. Um, we have such great opportunities on our campus from the walking trail to the track, um, to practice fields, to different areas on our playground. And so we're just gonna to have to be strategic um, about how we handle recess time. One of the things that we are gonna ask is that students uh, hand sanitize before they go to recess as well as when they come in from recess before they go to the classroom. Um, we know that that will be important. And when we have to have indoor recess, um, unfortunately we're going to have to make sure that kids stay within their classrooms and then have activities that allow them to have a break from school but still be safe. So maybe things like showing a movie or coloring a picture or playing hangman from their seat on the board or battleship, just things like that where we're, we're, we're still practicing best practices but allowing students to have that break. Because as you know, they can't go all day um, with no break. They've got to be able to interact and laugh and relax for a little bit before they go back into their content. Unfortunately, at this time, we are not going to permit visitors into our building. It's not that we don't love you and we don't want to see you, because of course we do, but we really need to control who's coming in the building. Um, and I know that there are some things that are deemed essential in which a parent would need to come into the building. So let's talk a second about maybe what would be essential and what wouldn't. If your child is the, top, uh, is the type of child that they forget their lunch, or they would rather you drop off McDonald's, or they forget their band instrument, or maybe they don't feel like carrying it on the bus, so they conveniently forget it, so you have to bring it. Not that any of our kids would do that, but if they did. Or they forgot their homework. Those are not essential reasons to come into the building. Now, they forgot medications, or something significant has happened at home and you need to bring your child home. Obviously, those are reasons in which a, a visitor or a parent would need to come into the building. Please be aware though that when you do come to the building, we are gonna take every single person through our safety protocols. So that means hand sanitizing, masking, temperature checks, et cetera. We're gonna target you through different entrances um, and that way we know exactly um, where you're coming in and we're minimizing the movement throughout the building. Again, not trying to be difficult, but really just trying to ensure the safety of those that are in our building every single day. Um, when at all possible, we're really going to encourage staff to do their meetings with parents virtually, whether that's through Zoom or Google Meet or uh, over the phone, um, just, just trying our best um, to eliminate people in the building. Now, this is going to be hard for some of our social groups, like our chamber, our PTCO, and other groups that come in and use our buildings. As of right now, we're really going to restrict that until the health department um, advises us otherwise. In terms of social distancing in non-classroom areas, inside and outside of the school, we're going to continue to teach, remind, and encourage social distancing. At this point, all of our field trips and assemblies are canceled. Unfortunately, at this time, that means, um, you know, no fall play. It means um, 
no winter productions, no band and choir concerts. And I know that that's, that's so hard for me to deliver because I know that that's something that kids love. But right now, it's not recommended that we allow large masses to come together. Um, and so that's something that the health department is advised against. The only field trip I have not canceled yet is the Washington, D.C. field trip. I was just trying to wait and give it as much time as possible before I canceled that trip. Um, so that really is the only trip that's, that's still kind of out there um, that I need to make a decision on. In terms of social distancing and non-classroom areas, um, we haven't even touched upon sports yet. That is a whole nother uh, beast within itself. Um, and so we'll be sure to get you information as we roll out all of the protocols that will pertain to what our sporting events and extracurricular activities will look like um, from the procedures of coming into the building to how many can we come in to how are we going to sell tickets. Uh, that's, that's just so much information that there's no way that uh, we could have had time to really put that out for you tonight. But be watching for that information as we put that together. Band and choir. A couple specific things with band and choir. We are requiring that our students remain six feet or more apart. When they're in choir, they'll have their mask on. With marching band, we're, we're really encouraging Mr. Nave that our students be outside as much as possible at six feet apart or more. Um, when they do have to practice inside, they're going to practice in the auditorium because it really maximizes the ability to space them out. Unfortunately, we will not be using our official marching band uniform this year. We're going to ask that they use their summer uniform. That way students can take those back and forth and can clean them. And then as marching band practice starts for summer, we're going to ask that uh, stu students' temperatures be taken at the start of each marching practice just so that we can ensure um, that the students are fever free and um, also ask them to hand sanitize. So let's talk a little bit about what happens when we have health things that break out. So students who are not diagnosed as COVID, these are students who go home because um, they weren't feeling well or they had a fever or whatever that may be. I just want you to know that a student must be fever free without medication. Actually that just changed. It should be for 24 hours. The CDC just made that change as of uh, January 20th. So they have to be fever free without the assistance of medication for 24 hours in order to come back to school. Upon returning to school, and I know this is going to be difficult for parents, the student must be transported by the parent or the guardian or an adult to the designated door, and I'm going to show you what that door is, I'm going to put you in touch with our school nurse and there will be a re-entry protocol that we'll have to take you through before the student can come back into school. I know that's a painful step and you're like, ugh, I might be late for work. But unfortunately, we have to make sure that those students that are coming back to school are healthy and ready to come back to school. And by putting them on the bus, it just exposes them to kids. Um, before we have that chance to do that double check. So again, that, that protocol is put in place just for the safety of everyone. Let's talk about what happens when a student tests positive or a student has symptoms or a staff member has symptoms of COVID. So the first bullet, a student or a staff member will immediately leave school if they have specific symptoms related to COVID. Depending on the symptom, that we may be able to just monitor their symptom at school. And what I mean by that is Nurse Allison, she's so phenomenal. She knows our kids. She knows which ones suffer from allergy or pollen or hay fever or have the chronic drippy nose. And so for some of those kids, they may be able to be at school because she knows their medical background and she knows that that's a typical symptom for them. For the other kids, there's going to be a screening process that we're going to go through when kids come down to see Nurse Allison because they're not feeling well. We're going to have two rooms set up, side-by-side -side rooms. So our, our, our first room is our, our traditional uh, sick room that Nurse Allison has always used. Um, and this is where kids that are going to go who need their, medica their daily medications, um, maybe they see her as a daily check-in, but they're not showing specific symptoms that could be potential COVID symptoms. In the room right next to her is our isolated room. So as we go through that screening process with Nurse Allison, if, she's, if she 
indicates that students have several symptoms that could be potentially COVID symptoms. Those students are going to be isolated in their own room next to her and will be supervised from there. At this point, we are looking at bringing on a second nurse to assist with this um, so that we can make sure that we have all hands on deck handling these situations. Those students who have the potential COVID symptoms will remain in that isolated room. We will contact you and ask you to come and get that, your child. And you will come through again that designated door. And I'm going to show you what that designated door is. We're going to ask you to step up to the door, much like Kroger Click List. There's going to be a number on the door that you'll call. It will dial you right to Allison. And you'll be able to say that you're, I'm Mrs. Bueller. I'm here to pick up my son. And you'll be brought into that little cubby in which you'll be reunited with your child and we'll give you a, a form that shows you these are the symptoms your child had, these are some recommended next steps, and this is the protocol in order for your child to return. And then you'll take your child out. That will alleviate students being picked up from the office. Again, we want to minimize how much activity we have through the building with students who are not feeling well, as well as, again, minimizing parents and visitors coming into the building. So that's why we've, we've selected the area that we've selected. If your child is found to be COVID positive, three things have to happen before their return. They have to be out for 10 days from the onset of their symptoms. They have to be fever free for 24 hours without the assistance of any fever reducing medication. So no ibuprofen or Motrin or Tylenol can be on board. And they have to have improvements in their symptoms. That's one way to get back to school. And again, we've come through that re-entry process with Nurse Allison. The other way to get back to school is to have two negative COVID tests done 24 hours apart signed off by a doctor and brought back to school. So those are the two ways once a student is diagnosed positive that they are able to re-enter back into the school. If a student tests positive, then that classroom will be deeply sanitized that night in preparation for the student's return the following day. Our staff that will be cleaning these rooms will be wearing all protective gear necessary to clean that room. Now let's talk about what happens should a student test positive. Um, and these protocols, protocols are, are what has been directly delivered from, to us from the Ottawa County Health Department. So let's say we have a third grader who tests positive. What happens? Mom calls the school, calls the principal, Mr. Humphrey, um, my child tested positive. From there, Mr. Humphrey gets a hold of Nurse Allison and myself, and we immediately reach out to the health department to make them aware or make sure they're aware that a particular student has been tested positive. And sometimes the health department may get to us before we get to them, especially if this is something that's happened over the weekend. At that point, we will answer all of the necessary questions that the health department has for us. Now, this is the advantage of the mask and the polycarbonate shield. Because if we're a third grader and we have one third grader test positive, because in our classrooms, we are socially distanced, we are behind the protective barrier, which is either the mask or the shield, and because students are not in close proximity without a mask or a shield for more than 15 minutes, those children do not have to go home. Now, if we were a school district that said, hey, masks are optional, whatever you want to do, we highly recommend it, but if you don't want to wear a mask, that's okay. If we were that school, and that same third grader tested positive, that entire classroom would go home for 14 days because those students would be exposed to that positive student for more than 15 minutes without a protective barrier and potentially at a close distance. So that really was why for us, the shield and the polycarbonate dust divider and the mask were so important. Same thing if we had a high school student who tested positive. Because our kids and our staff are behind the mask or behind the polycarbonate divider, they are protected. Therefore, they don't have to go home. So let's go back to the positive case. We find out, we talk to the health department, we answer questions. 
that parent whose child tested positive is going to get a call from the health department. From there, the health department is con going to conduct their contract tracing. They're going to talk with who did you who did you see last, who did you interact with, etc. And they will then reach out to the health department. Will then reach out to any other families that they feel need to quarantine for 14 days. We as a school will not be putting out anything on social media or letting people know that there's been a positive case. It's not because we're not trying to be transparent, but we have to be very protective not to violate HIPAA. And so that's why the health department has said, no, we will handle those cases. We will make those contacts. We will figure out who potentially else needs to go into quarantine. Now, let's go back to that third grader. That third grader tested positive. And last night, that third grader had a birthday party. And Sally, who's in that same class, was at that birthday party, and they didn't have a mask on. The health department may say to Sally, Sally, you're going to need to go home for 14 days because you were in close proximity to that student who tested positive. And again, you're going to hear and have that conversation with the health department. Now, because of how we're offering remote learning, if our students have to go home, for whatever reason. They have to go home because they tested positive. They have to go home because a sibling tested positive. They have to go home because they have a fever and they're just suffering from the occasional stomach flu and they're at home. Because of the skill of our staff and the way we're, we're approaching instructional delivery, your child's not gonna miss content. Because if they're healthy and they're able we're going to ask that they log in from home right into the classroom, receiving that stru instruction as if they were sitting right there, but they're sitting from the comfort of their home as they go through that. And that was really important to us because we recognized that kids could end up being at home for 10 to 14 days because of some kind of health symptom that they can't help. And we don't want them to miss that valuable instruction. And so whether you've decided that you're going to be a remote learner and, and be at home, or you decide, I want our kids to be at school, and they end up remotely because of something that medically happened, they are going to still be able to receive their instruction from our staff real time and be able to stay caught up on their content and not fall behind. I did list on the bottom of the slide the difference between um, quarantine and isolation. Isolation is 10 days. This is for somebody who has been confirmed positive. And quarantine is for somebody that maybe could be suspected as becoming positive. They give it 14, 14 days because those first four days they're watching for symptoms. And so I just put that language on there just so that you could read the difference. Also, on the following slide, I put in a link that was provided to us directly from the Ohio Department of Health that if you have questions about close contact or quarantine, I'm just going to direct you right to the professionals. I am not a healthcare provider. I am not a scientist. I'm leaning on those professionals, those experts, to deliver us that information to walk us through each of those scenarios. I want you to know that the health department will be here on August 27th to meet with our staff, to really work with our staff on how do we handle this virus, what are things that we should do and shouldn't do, etc. Um, and really, every case that we have, every sick child or staff member that we have will be handled on an individual basis. We're not going to rush through it. We're going to take our time, dot our I's, and cross our T's, and make sure we are doing exactly as the health department advises us to do. In terms of returning back to school, I mentioned this earlier. I'm just going to hit it real quickly one more time. In order to come back to school, you can't put your kid on the bus and say, ah, fine, head to school. Can't do that. Got to bring them to the designated door. Got to meet with Nurse Allison um, and her staff must meet the criteria in order to come back to school, and then we pick up where we left off. The door that we're going to utilize is the door that leads into right by Nurse Allison's um, sick room. I often like to say to the kids, I joke with the kids, you've got you to pass the golf course grass before you get to this floor. But this is the door, and the only door that we're going to utilize to bring kids in and out. 
Um, and so I just wanted to, to show you a picture of where that door was so that should you ever have to pick up your child or go through the return policy to bring them back into their school, return them back into um, the classroom, you knew where that door was. These are some things for the staff. Um, that doesn't really pertain to you, but just really working with our staff on, you know, we, I, as much as I'm concerned about the safety of our students, I'm also equally concerned about the safety of our staff. And so this, this slide kind of pertains directly to them and things that we need to work through. I want to let you know that as a disclaimer, the Ottawa County Health Department can't officially sign off on any plans or on our documents um, for return to school. Um, rather, the Ottawa County Health Department is just available as a resource guide to us. They provide guidance to us in order to keep our staff and students safe, as safe as possible during the pandemic. So that in a nutshell is, is basically the safety uh, protocols that, that we're going to be following um, as we reopen this fall. Now some of the things we haven't talked about, as I said, we haven't talked about sports, we haven't talked about fabulous parent pickup um, because we're going to have specific details as to how we're going to handle a parent pickup at the end of the day. So we still have other nuts and bolts that we need to finish and put together, but that's really the meat of a lot of, of our health side of things. So let's talk about instruction. As I said, you have the opportunity to choose how you want your child's education delivered to you. I believe keeping you enrolled as a Danbury student, a Danbury family, keeping you connected to us during this challenging time, I believe is an incredible opportunity. And we really want your kids with us. And we really want to help you navigate this process of what might be best for you. As we look at that, um, I want you to know that we did adjust the school calendar. There's a lot that's going to be put on the plates of our teachers. We're so lucky to have the staff that we have that are already putting in countless hours as we prepare for the fall. They want to see our kids. They want to deliver the best education that they can. You know, what happened in the spring? Remember, when we started spring, we thought we were going to be in remote instruction for three weeks, having no idea we were going to be in for the rest of the school, the school year. So what spring looks like or look like is not what fall is going to look like. And so our staff are already working tirelessly, preparing for the demands and the challenges that are coming ahead as we get ready to open our school buildings. So what we did is we felt it was important to adjust the start of our calendar. So our students are now going to start after the holiday, like, like we typically do. Um, they're going to start on Tuesday the 8th. And the reason that is, is because collectively we have a ton of professional development that we need to offer to our staff. And, and I want to designate five days to be able to do that. The other thing that we're considering, and, and this isn't uh, worked out in stone yet, but I just want to put this on your radar. We are looking at the potential to stagger start our kids over those first couple days of school because we recognize that for those kids that are coming back into our building, school's going to look different. And so we're going to have to take a lot of extra time and care in teaching them about what this is going to look like, um, as well as our staff. And so I just wanted to put out there that there could be the potential that, that while we're definitely starting on September 8th, we may not have all of our kids here on September 8th. We may stagger them in. And as we, we show up those details, and if we think that's something that's, that's going to happen, we will get that information out to you as, as soon as possible. Our objectives. Whether we are in option one, option two, or option three, our objective is to create a seamless plan that allows us to move from various options at any time. We want it to be meaningful, engaging, and appropriate. We want it to build, strengthen, and maintain positive relationships between our students, our staff, and our parents. We have an emphasis on high quality instruction, activities, and assessments, both remotely and in person. And then as you can read, and I'm not going to read this verbatimly, but you can see that we've outlined some expectations for each one of us. That, you know, what are we really going to hold ourselves accountable for? And I, I'm not going to take time to read through all of that right now, but you can read that at your leisure. Let's talk about kind of the umbrella expectations for us as a district, uh, both administratively, staff, parents, students. There's some common expectations that whether we're in option one, two, or three that we're going to have. And let's look at what those common expectations are. Culture. 
We want to create a learning culture that mirrors our core values, that aligns with our mission while working collaboratively, sharing willingly, networking frequently, and maintaining our students' best interest at the forefront of everything that we do. We want to communicate to the best of our ability. We want to be proactive. We want to be positive. We want to be professional. We want to be continuous and ongoing in our communication. We want to use various methods to communicate with our parents. Folks, we don't know Well, we don't know if you don't tell us. And please don't wait and let it snowball and fester until you're ready to blow and explode. Let's have an ongoing dialogue and communication back and forth because we want to deliver the very best to your students. And that's going to take a partnership from you. As we surveyed parents, there was a couple things we learned. We learned how our parents want to receive information. So we're going to start utilizing the Remind app. This is a feature that we use athletically, but we not use consistently throughout the district. And now it's going to be a district-wide app that we're going to use that allows our teachers to text you information or reminders. Um, they have the opportunity to, to record their voice and send a short message to you. And if you want to text back, then you can text back and that text goes back to the teacher. I'm going to discourage our staff from using their personal cell phones, using their personal Facebook Messenger accounts to interact with you. I want them to interact with you through the Remind app, um, through email, through Schoology or Seesaw, or through a phone call. One of the things that we want to do over the next couple of weeks is we want to create a link on our website to help you navigate the platforms that we're going to use moving forward. One thing that we learned in our survey is our parents said, I need some consistency. I need, a, I need everything to look the same so I know where to go. I can't click here, click here, click there, I need a password. So we really have spent a lot of time this summer streamlining that for you. And I recognize we need to show you how to navigate some of those. So we're going to really put an emphasis on progress book. This is where our grades are recorded. Um, our instruction for grades 4 through 12 will run through Schoology. Our instruction for grades 3 through, or excuse me, K through 3 will run through Seesaw. We're going to use the Remind app, pre-K through 12. And then the other thing that we're going to put links on our web page for is resources for you. And I would ask you to start watching that as we get closer to the start of school. We're going to put videos up about how do we properly hand wash, how do we properly wear our mask and take off our mask. Um, what are some signs and symptoms maybe you should look for in your child before putting them on the bus? So we just really want to create um, some resources for you as a parent so that you're kind of prepared as we begin to move into the school year. We're still going to utilize final forms, so please know final forms is going to open soon. Um, and that's something that if you filled out final forms last year, which I know about 95% of you did, be reassured. Final forms this year, so much quicker and easier because you've already got it typed in, so you just have to verify that the information is right. Um, but we're going to ask that you update that because that's going to open here soon. Our instruction is going to be daily. We don't believe in every other day. Um, at this point, we don't believe in hybrid. We believe in quality instruction every single day, whether you're in person or remote. Um, as I said, our platform, meaning where our, student, our, where our teachers are going to be putting their content, putting their activities, putting their videos, putting the links to how students are going to come into the classroom, putting what homework assignments there are, that one-stop shop for those places so that you know where to go. We want to de develop a high level of expectations connected with meaningful activities and assessments. We want it, our teachers to be engaged in interactive lessons with our students. Now listen, our students, no matter where they are, are going to participate daily. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what that's going to look like daily, what that structure is going to look like if they're not coming to school and you'd like them to go remote and speak about what that's going to look like. Progress book, that's where we're going to put grades um, and assignments. Students are going to be required to follow the same schedule of when assignments are due, whether they're in option one here at school, option two home remotely. Deadlines are deadlines. We, we're learning that kids still need to learn those soft skills. They still need to learn that responsibility. And so no matter where they're learning from, their assignments are still going to be graded. They're still going to be provided quality feedback, and they're still going to follow those same timelines. Um, Google Meet is really the main platform we're going to have students and staff using as they're watching that real-time lesson take place. 
Instructional delivery, our students will be engaged daily in their classrooms or in their class period instructions. They're going to follow the district calendar. And as I said, all assignments will be submitted electronically through Schoology or Seesaw. Attendance is going to be taken every single day. And for our middle school and high school students, attendance is going to be taken in each class period. I know in the spring, we had some flexibility with attendance. In the fall, we don't. House Bill 410 stands. Rules in regards to attendance, as it's stated in our handbooks, are followed. So therefore, our students have to be in class each and every day. Engagement. Uh, we're going to ask that our teachers use a variety of instructional tools to promote and maintain instructional concepts. So while our teachers are delivering the lesson, they still have the ability to incorporate um, different resources and different tools to help support and enhance their lessons. So you're still going to see that happen. Feedback is important. As I mentioned previously, please use those channels of appropriate feedback so that we can help you in the best way that we can. Grading, we're going to follow our standard, standard grading policy um, and we're going to grade our students elementary, middle school, and high school as the, as the handbooks indicate and we're going to grade them at the same level um, with the same expectation whether our students are sitting in the desk or they're sitting and learning from home. And we're also going to utilize all of our support staff to make sure that we're continuing to support our students in the areas in which they need support in. I just listed here for you, just, just as another glance, some of our common technology tools that we use. Um, I know that we reference them, and sometimes people are like, well, I don't know what Progress Book is. And so that's why I wanted to make sure that I listed out not only what were those tools, but what were they, so that you knew that. So let's say you're a parent right now, and you're like, Carrie, at this point right now where I sit, I just don't know that I'm comfortable bringing our kids into the classroom. What's my option? Here's your option. I want your student to stay connected with us. I believe we at Danbury have the best staff. I believe we have a solid curriculum. We want to set your children up for success past high school. And not just academically, but with our core values and everything else that we do. But I want to respect those parents that just, for whatever reason, feel uncertain about bringing their this time. So what we're setting up is an opportunity for you to let us know that you want your child to go remote. And that means I'm asking you to make a commitment nine weeks at a time and let us know if you're going to be learning from home or in the classroom. And so for some of you, I envision that some of you are like, uh, I, I'm not there yet. That's fine. Let us know and learn from home for the first nine weeks. And at the end of the nine weeks, come the end of October, the early November, things are better for you and you decide, you know what, I'm, I'm ready. I want our kids to be back in school. Then guess what? They're right on track. They've been with their teachers. They've been following their schedule. They're right where everyone is on the curriculum. It's a very seamless transition right back into the classroom. And so really this design, and, and again, praises and kudos to our staff for the work that they're putting forth to create the opportunity that, might I say, not many schools are doing, where our students are going to be afforded the opportunity to learn from home or learn here and be getting all of the same instruction. Now, let's say you're a parent who says, I want our students for right now to learn from home. What does that look like? Let's talk about what the objective is and why we even set up remote learning. Danbury Local Schools recognizes that not all families at this time are comfortable returning to our campus for learning in classrooms. So therefore, we want to offer this distance learning opportunity and make it meaningful, engaging, and appropriately paced. The distance learning option is set out to be a temporary plan. Once a family feels comfortable to have their child or their children re return back, to campus, to our site, the transition will be seamless. The students will be receiving their distance learning directly from our Danbury teachers anyway. Distance learning, learning from home, is going to look drastically different than what it looked like in the spring. Students will learn from home remotely. They will be assigned to their Danbury teachers or they will be provided a schedule. 
the schools will provide for you a Chromebook. So you'll have the necessary equipment that you need at home for your child to be, uh, be able to engage in our instruction. Students will use the Chromebook and use the Google Meet app to attend live sessions by their teacher or teachers during their assigned class period time. Distance learners will not have to log in during lunch, they won't have to log in during recess, and they won't have to log in during transitions. They can take that break. Each classroom will have webcams so that they can stream live instructions where students can participate in real time. Through Google Meet, the students will, will be right there through the screen in the classroom. They will be able to ask questions. They'll be able to participate in groups. They'll be able to see and hear conversation and what's going on. The webcams and Google Meets have the hand raising feature, so it, it provides and allows for that consistent interaction. Elementary parents may have to either download or pick up weekly packets to assist with that balanced learning. I recognize that in the elementary, not everything can be done through the screen. So on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. in our vestibule, you'll have the ability to pick up the paper packets or the resources that you will need as well as drop off materials that you have been working on. And then of course, picking up things that will be graded. It will be kind of like a, an even, even flow process back and forth. Students in grades K through three will be assessing um, their assignments and uh, submitting their work through, through a format called Seesaw. Students in grades four through 12 will be assessing their, accessing their assignments, sorry about that, accessing their assignments and submitting their work through Schoology. Now I know what you're thinking. If you're a parent and you have a third grader and you're a parent who, who has an eighth grader, um, you're thinking, gosh, I have kids that are using different platforms. Why couldn't they have all just used one? Here's the simplest way. Seesaw does a lot of the same features that Schoology does. It offers a lot of the same opportunities. The difference is Seesaw is more age appropriate for our younger learners. The ability to upload things and submit things, the read aloud features and other things are more geared towards our younger students, meaning they can be a little bit more independent in that process. And we just feel that Schoology is just, it's just a harder platform and, and developmentally our K3 kids just aren't ready for that yet. Um, and so that's why there are two separate platforms. A detailed schedule will be provided by the student's teacher with a Google Meet code and a time to log in. So students will know what time they need to log in. They'll be provided the codes that they need to be able to log in. Students will be ex expected to submit their assignments and their assessments by their teacher established deadlines. Late submissions could result in grade reduction. Another main difference, and I just want to make sure you know, that if you choose remote, we are expecting our students to follow a normal school schedule and to be in that classroom during those scheduled times. That way they can get the instructions live and they can ask questions. Now, if you as a parent are working and you want to be able to assist your child later on, and let's say you need to see um, how something is done or you didn't, they didn't quite understand something, or let's say we have a sick child, um, they have a stomach flu, they were in bed all day. They didn't feel better until later that night, and they wanted to log in. Under the Seesaw and the Schoology platform, there will be many video lessons that have been, that have been recorded throughout the day, which will allow you as a parent and a student to sign in and get a, a good chunk or the core of that content delivered so that you're caught back up. We're not going to require that the entire 40-minute lesson be recorded. It'll just be the meat of that lesson that we feel or the teacher feels is the highlight of what you would need to know or the student would need to know should they not be able to sign in because they were sick. So if you're choosing remote, please make sure your child knows this is not sleep in till 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Get up, get logged in, do a couple hours of school, email the teacher at 10 o'clock at night, expect a response, that's not going to happen. If they're in that remote setting, they are with us real time, all day, every day. 
getting the instruction real time. That allows our teachers to work their normal day. It also means that no matter where our students are, home or here, they are, re they are receiving that high quality instruction. Now let's talk about returning to school. Students may transition out of distance learning and come back into our regular school setting at the end of each quarter. If you have concerns prior to that, I would encourage you to reach out to your building administrator and have conversations with them about that. What I want to try to avoid is students coming in and out of remote learning. In other words, we're not going to be here two days, be home a week. Be here three days, be home two weeks. Be here a day and be back. That can't happen. Now, I recognize that there are some circumstances in which you may want to pull your kid home for a couple weeks. Something may happen. There may be an uptick. You may be concerned. You want to bring your, home, your child home for three weeks because of that. We can work with you on that. Reach out to your teacher or reach out to your building administrator and have those conversations. We want to be flexible. That's the advantage of being seamless between these two models. All I'm saying is the student isn't going to pick and choose each day where they're going to learn from. This is not a revolving door on a day-to-day -day basis. That creates too much inconsistency for our staff as they're setting up resources and materials and labs, et cetera. They have to have an expectation and an idea of who's going to be here. Families will contact the school offices to schedule your child's return and then begin following the safety guidelines and our return to classroom plan when they come back to in-class learning when you, when you decide to bring them back in. Okay, so let's say you're the parent not wanting them to come to school uh, and be in our school. You're like, you know what, Carrie, I, I just don't know how I would facilitate having my child log in all day, every day. Then let's talk about what option three is. Option three for you is our customized learning plan. The objective for this is that we recognize that not all of our families at this time are comfortable returning back to campus for learning. We recognize that maybe having students logged in all day, every day, isn't maybe ideal for you. Therefore, a customized learning option is being offered in order to provide meaningful, engaging, and appropriately placed lessons. The customized learning option allows maximum flexibility and gives students the choice in not only lesson structure, but engagement time. Parents and students who decide to pursue option three, you will be required to meet with your building principal and devise the plan that meets the individual educational needs of your student. Once a family feels comfortable in having their children return back to the campus, the district will work with you to transition you back in. If you choose option three, we will still issue you a Chromebook so you have the technology that you need. And we will work with you in the details around curriculum delivery and the expectations that goes with those formatted programs. And so um, I know that there's not a lot of specifics on this slide about option three. I can tell you that we have three main models, three main curriculum platforms that we're working with and we're partnering with. And really the best way to help you navigate this is a meeting where you sit down with the building administrators and you're able to say, this is what my son or daughter needs. This is the curriculum that we're looking for. This is the pace we're looking for. This is the time structure we're looking for. And let us really work with you to go through that. Now, I recognize right now, if you watch social media or the news, I mean, K-12 online instructions make a killing right now and pushing out their advertisement of come sign up for our, our free K-12 instruction. Listen, there's pros and cons to everything. I would ask that you meet with us and let us work with you on what would be the best option for your child. I view this as making a medical decision. I'm not a medical doctor. So if I'm ready to make a decision on a treatment for my child, I'm going to reach out to the medical professionals to sit down with them and say, here's the medical issues of my daughter. What are the best options for me? And I'm reaching out to that medical professional because this is what they do day in and day out. This is their training. And I want the very best for my daughter, so I want to reach out to those experts. I'd ask that you give us that same opportunity. If you don't know what fall's going to look like for your family and you're unsure of the right path, folks, we only have one chance 
to deliver the best education to our kids as possible. This is the foundation. If they're an elementary student, this is the foundation for their high school success. If you're a middle school, high school student, this is the foundation for success in life after school, whether that's career, whether that's college, whether that's enlist, whether that's employ, whatever that might be. Let us help you make that decision. And we want to support you and find the best option for your child. And we realize we could be spending the next month doing nothing but meeting with parents. But you know what? We're committed to that. We're Danbury. That's what we want to do is meet with you one-on-one -on -one and help you figure out that plan. And know that if you do go option three and you sit down with our administrators and you pick an option that you feel at this point in time best fits you, that when you're ready, we'll talk with you about when the best time is to, trans to, to uh, transition you back into our school. Because listen, folks, at the end of the day, I want your babies here. I want them with us. We want to be able to see them and interact with them, build relationships with them, make a difference in their lives. And so I just hope and pray that in time, we are all going to have the opportunity to come back together. Let's touch for just a second on preschool. Just so you know, um, the Ohio Department of Education came out today with some revisions to their preschool standards. I still haven't had an opportunity to completely flesh through those details with our staff. So this information is current as of this morning at 7, at 7 a.m. before the change came. So uh, be watching because this could change. But as of right now, um, we're going to offer an a.m. and a p.m. And I have those times listed. We're going to do a meet and greet on September 8th through 11th. Um, and you'll be receiving, uh, receiving a call with a schedule of when that's going to be. And our first day of preschool is going to be September 14th. We can't wait to see them. Um, preschool this year, uh, days of operation. So our four-year-olds currently in this model will operate and attend on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Currently, we can only have nine students in our preschool at a time. Um, I think that's going to change, but as of when this was last revised, um, we're going to have our three-year-old classrooms. They're going to meet on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And again, um, I think those, those numbers may adjust, but that's where they're set as of right now. Our procedures, so you know, for a.m. session and afternoon p.m. session, our students are going to be dropped off and picked up at the east side preschool doors. Parents and guardians, you, I ask that you please park in the empty visitors parking spots that we have for you. And all students will have their temperature taken upon arrival. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going to allow our parents to enter the building, so you'll have to say your goodbyes at the door. And all morning and afternoon preschool students will be dismissed one at a time to their parent or guardian from the east side preschool doors. And so we'll make sure that we reiterate that to you and explain that to you as you get closer. I've listed the fees for preschool this year. Unfortunately, in terms of snacks, families will be asked to provide their own snack for their own preschool student. Remote learning. So the K-12 remote distant learning plan does not apply to our preschool program unless we would all have to go remote. So keep that in mind. Some of your safety and cleaning protocols so that you know upon arrival, students will have a temperature checked. They're going to receive hand sanitizer or we're going to ask that they wash their hands. Hand washing will be taught and used at arrival and before and after snack. And all of our surfaces and center-based education materials and toys will be thoroughly cleaned between each session. Masks are optional for our preschool students. We will be providing our polycarbonate desk shields for peer interaction and for our learning centers. I want you to be aware that we continue to follow out of the county's risk levels. And so for us, that's, that's yellow, orange, red, and purple. Um, currently, as you know, uh, we are in level orange. Um, in order to uptick to another level, it's all about how many indicators that are met as they move up a, le a level. I re receive uh, reports daily from the Ottawa County Health Department that tell me how many people are tested positive, um, how many people are tested negative, how many people are hospitalized, how many people are ICU, how many people are deaths, what are the ages, how many indicators are being hit, how close are we to red. And so I'm, I review those every single day. Um, and, and please know that if we get close to fluctuating between levels, that that's, that's an ongoing conversation that we will be having with the Ottawa County Health Department. So how did those levels connect to us? Currently, as of today, when we are in level 
or when we are yellow, or when we are orange, or when we are yellow red, we are all here. Now, I will give this little caveat. If we hit level three, I am working with our team um, to look at different ways that we can reduce classroom capacity within the building. I am not in favor of a K-6 model in which our students are only here half the time and they're at home the other half of the time. I understand what a strain that puts on working families. So we have to be creative here in Danbury um, about how we can deliver our education and yet social distance at a higher level if we need to. So I just want to make sure that, that you know that that's something that we are looking at. If we go purple, then it will be um, then we will all go to that remote learning platform. Again, where we're going to have students from home signing in the classroom real time and going through their schedule and getting that information. Now, could there be a chance that maybe we run a, a shortened day and maybe the students are only in for four hours instead of seven? Potentially, but the instruction itself, the delivery, of the instruction will be in a very similar format as to what it is as we start school. As a reminder, this information that I'm sharing with you tonight as of 825 is information that I have at this moment. We will continue to reevaluate based on evolving conditions, data about the status of the pandemic, and of course, recommendations and guidance from our public health authorities and our scientific community. This could all change in two weeks. But what I want to do is make sure that we are informed, that we're making the best decisions possible for our families, and that we're keeping our students and our staff and this community as safe as humanly possible, while also delivering the best education, which is what I believe our students need. If you have questions, concerns, comments, please, please, please email me. I'm probably going to ask then, I'll respond to your email and ask that we set up a time to meet. Um, if there's pockets of parents that, that would be willing to meet together, we may socially distance and meet together. Uh, we may be able to meet through a Google Meet. We may be able to meet through a phone call. Um, taking to social media to air your frustrations and questions is not how I'm going to respond to you. I value face-to-face -face or over-the-phone conversations. You need to be able to hear my tone. I need to be able to hear yours. We need to be able to engage back and forth so that we can have meaningful conversations and so that we can answer your questions. And so if that means over the next month I spend a lot of my time answering your questions, and making sure that I hear your concerns or helping you find or make a decision that's best for your family, we are committed for that. All I need is an email. Your feedback is important. So if there's things about tonight that really spoke to you, good and bad, email me. I would love to hear from you and hear your thoughts and your takeaways and your opinions about how we as a Danbury community are going to um, embark on this together. At this time, I want to give opportunity for questions. Um, questions that you might have, um, maybe they're specific to you, maybe it's you need a clarifying question based on something that I've already shared. In the room, um, a considerable distance away from me, I have our administrators here just in case it's something that maybe it would be a question that they would be able to answer. Um, answer better than I could. So I would just ask that you take a moment and maybe type your questions um, in the response below, um, and then we can we can spend a little bit of time here answering some some questions that that our community or our parents have.
So some of our first questions are coming across about lunches. If your student forgets their lunch, I think we'll still have the ability for you to put it in the vestibule. Obviously, we want to make sure that you contact the office and let them know that you're dropping off a lunch. Make sure that that lunch is in um, some sort of sealed container or closed bag. Make sure that the student's lunch, or excuse me, the student's name is on it. Um, but listen, I'm, I'm really going to encourage that if a student would per forget their lunch, they have the ability to purchase a lunch, even if they have to charge it and pay it back the next day. We have sack lunches here, but if, if you really feel that it's important for your child to have the lunch that you provided, I would ask that you just let the office know, put that in the vestibule with their name on it, and then we will come out and get that and make sure that that gets delivered to um to your child. In terms of the pool and swimming classes, obviously those are definitely details that we need to sit and look through. How can we assure social distancing? Um, and what does that look like? How would we utilize the pool? I think before I would really tackle anything that has to do with the pool, I would want to sit down with our health department and ask them what are the specific protocols that I would need to put in place in order for our students to utilize the pool. And I'm just asking that, that Mr. Natecki or our administrators feed our questions. So I'm just kind of deferring to them as they feed questions that come up on the screen because I can't see your questions. All right. So the, the next question has to do with option two. And if they're on option two, will they be able to participate in athletics? If you are on option two, absolutely you can participate in athletics. Here is the legal guideline behind this. If you are a dandary student, and you are here every day, or you are remote learning in option two, or you're option three with a customized learning plan, you are a Danbury student. You are afforded all of the opportunities of all of our extracurricular, op extracurricular activities. And so we would want you to be involved in that if you feel that's safe for you and your family to participate in. Good question. I like when I hear him say, you covered yeah. that one, you covered that one. Uh, are applications for open enrollment going to be accepted? Applications for open enrollment will be accepted. Folks, you need to know that by law, we have approved a policy that we are an open enrolled school. And so, yes, we will allow open enrollment. Now, there are some parameters at times that we have to follow, numbers and some specific guidelines that we have to follow when we're accepting open enrollment students. Um, and there's legal language that goes with that. So obviously, we administratively look through each one of those open enrollment applications individually to determine their acceptance into the school. Okay, are the preschool classes full? Currently, our preschool classes are not full. Is the school supply list changing? As to my knowledge, school supplies uh, have not changed. I think the one thing that I'll speak to is that in the classroom, we really want to limit sharing of supplies. And so our teachers and how they've handled the supplies in the past is probably now going to look a little bit different um, because we'll want our kids using their own supplies. The other thing that I want to just do a quick shout out on, and, and you're going to see more information come through social media here soon, is we're now going to offer a before school program. You know, our parents express that they want the ability to drop their students off in the morning um, and then be able to go to work. And so something new to Danbury this year is our before school program. And we're super lo um, lucky. We have Allison Smith. Um, she's so creative and so great with kids. She's going to be leading this with us. And so if that's something that you might be interested in, um, there is a minimal fee that goes with that. But if you are in need of um, child care program before school, that's coming. And as you know, as in the past, we will continue to offer, offer our after school program if you're a parent who needs after school care for your children. Um, if we decide after a week in the classroom we're no longer comfortable and want to switch to another option, is that possible? Absolutely. I know that it's hard to visualize exactly what these options are going to look like. And so, yes, parents have the option within the first week of school or maybe the first two week, weeks of school to assess the situation and then to devise another plan with us. That's just going to take communication with us so that we can, um, first, let's see if we can fix what's frustrating you. 
Um, and if not, then let's devise a plan that works for you. If we go to purple, will all children be sent home with Chromebook? Yes. If we go to purple, all students will be sent home with a Chromebook so they have the ability to come in through Google Meet and, and, and be able to learn through that live format. Can we send pack lunches with our children? You can send lunches with your children. Uh, any guidance on open house? That's a super great question. We're really trying to work through the details of open house. I think the thing about open house is I know as a parent how important it is um, to allow children to come in and see the environment, to meet their teacher, to see the classroom that they're going to be in, to ask questions, etc. So we're really going to be try to be creative about how we offer open house. Um, you know, whether that's going to be broke up by teacher, by grade level, by family. Um, but I know that that's something that's really on the top of our list to process through what open house will look like. Uh, what does, if we have to pick up our children from school, how does that work? So if you have to pick up your children from school, um, and I'm going to assume you're picking them up because you have a phone call that they weren't feeling. Let's go two ways. You have a phone call that your child's not feeling well and they need to be picked up from school. We're going to ask that you use the door um, closest to Nurse Allison and that's where you'll be picking up children that aren't feeling well. If you have a regularly scheduled appointment, your child's not sick, you had a family emergency, you had an orthodontist appointment, we're going to ask that you contact the office and one of two things will happen. You may just enter the vestibule and get them from there and a student will come out or you may give, give us the make and model of your car and we may bring your kid to the door and watch them um, exit the building. Because again, we want to we minimize you coming all the way into the building. But that'll be how we handle those situations. Okay, so for students who are open enrolled and reside in another county, will the risk level in the county the student lives in affect the student? Any school room for remote options. So. As, as I've been advised, I have been advised that our students that are here are following our colors. And so if a parent had concern because of the county color that they were under, I would ask that they reach out and talk to myself or a building administrator and we can process through that situation on an individual basis. Uh, next question has to do with what if a parent tests positive for the children don't have symptoms. Okay, so here is what automatically be potentially an assumed positive and they would want them home for 14 days. Um, now, if something about that would change, obviously we would be in contact with you. And please let us know that if, if you or someone in your immediate family test positive, please contact the school so that we have the opportunity to reach out to the Ottawa County Health Department and we can work with you on what that looks like now for your children. Okay, question about why are there no temperature checks when the kids get on the buses? That's a really good question. That's definitely something that we spent a lot of time talking about. And really, that just comes down to um, safety um, and how long our routes would take in order for that to happen. And so the health department is saying as long as the children are in their mask and keeping in mind that they're not crossing paths with other people on the bus because they're going to get on the bus and they're going to load from the back forward and then they're going to be social distance as they get off the bus, that, it, that the Ottawa County Health Department is saying that we're clear to do the temperature checks when we get in the building. Okay, um, how will speech classes work with kindergartners on the remote option? Uh, what we'll do is we'll work with our speech teacher and we'll set up specific times in your child's schedule in which we'll utilize Google Meet and they will work through um, the virtual line
to be able to deliver those services. And this isn't just speech. This is speech. This is Title I. It's some of those one-on-one -on -one interventions and other opportunities that we work with our students. We'll have our paras who may be um, working one-on-one -on -one with remediation with some of our students, and we're going to set up times in your child's schedule in which they'll be online with that person working on the necessary skills or um, IEP goals or whatever that case may be. Um, making sure that they get those supports at home, no different than if they were here. That's a great question. And another one related to that about kids on IEPs on option two. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We have to meet those goals of our IEP students. I think the one thing that you guys will find is if you choose option two, you will probably get a phone call from one of our administrators. And so I, I go back to the, the students that are on IEPs. You're probably going to hear from Ms. Wise. She's going to reach out and talk with you, share with you about how those services and supports are going to be delivered. She's going to answer questions that you have. Um, if you're, if you're uh, another, uh, I could see Mr. Humphrey or Mr. Miller reaching out to you, making sure that that we've answered all questions and that we have an understanding together of what remote looks like. Um, and so if you do indicate that you want the remote option, I would expect a phone call from one of our administrators just so that we know that we're all on the same page. I'm going to push out a form here soon, um, which is going to ask for some feedback. And within that form, I'm asking that by September 15th, you let us know. I'm sorry, I'm already fast forwarding a month. August, we'll be letting, you'll be letting us know by August 15th um, which option that you're planning to do. And, and we recognize that could change right before school. And if that's the case, we would just like a courtesy phone call so we can help you plan. But giving us that feedback in that survey, as well as indicating what your choice of instruction is going to be, whether it's option one, option two, or option three, that just allows us to plan um, and also to schedule meetings. Because like I said, if you're option three, we need to meet with you. If you're option two, we need to extend a phone call to you so that we're all on the same page about how this is going to look. So be thinking about um, what that option is going to be for you. And that's why I also say, if you have questions or need a conversation, reach out to myself or the administrator so that we can get those questions answered for you so that by August 15th, you're able to make that decision for your family. I know somebody said, well, what if I have one child that I want to send Option one, I, I have one child that I want to be here at school, and I have another child that I want to be remote learning. Is that okay? Absolutely. We're here to meet the needs of your family and your children. A uh, question about buses. Will they be sanitized between the high school and elementary routes? Yes. Buses will be sanitized between routes. Will the students be able to use their own book bags for transporting supplies? Yes, yeah, students will be required to use their own bags when transporting things. Okay, question about uh, your connection with the uh, Ottawa County Health, Health Department. Do you okay. have a, a direct line to the Health Department? Some concerns that, that maybe they've been slow to react to questions from the general public. Yes, they are slow to react to the general public. My main uh, connection to the Health Department is the Health Director, uh, Jerry as well as the um, as well as two other individuals that I that work directly on Jerry's team and those are the three individuals that I reach out to um, and and work with on a day-to-day -day basis uh, whether that's through text through phone call or through email I have a direct line to those three individuals I think that's all all the questions. Do you want to see if maybe we missed some? They're coming pretty fast and furious there for a while. Yeah, are there any other questions that any of you may have? I'm sure by this time everyone's ready for a popcorn refill, maybe a beverage refill. All right, with choosing option two in the high school, we'd be in touch with Mr. Miller by email. Yes, so if you're choosing option two and you're in the high school, I would ask that you email Mr. Miller and he can answer questions that you have and or talk with you about your schedule. And, and, and again, remember, there's going to be a survey coming. 
So this is, don't feel like you have to send an email to your building administrator and say, hey, I'm going to go option two. I would ask that you hold a minute and wait for that survey to come out and then indicate within that survey what option you're going to do. I would reach out to myself or the building administrators if you have specific questions as you're trying to navigate the decision of where you, what option you want for um, your student. Will HIPAA compliant numbers be provided to district families of COVID positive staff and students? No. We will not. Ottawa County Health Department has asked us not to be the person, not to be the entity that's releasing information. They really want that to funnel through them. Um, and that way, if you have specific questions, those specific questions can be directly um, directed back at them. students be able to use their own bags between classes? I'm assuming this is high school, middle school. Use your bags between, between classes? That's something we're going to have to think about. There's some safety things that go with that. Um, so let us process that. Um, and, and I'll have Mr. Miller address that as we've had time to think through that. That's what we have right okay. Now. Listen, it's been great. Um, to have an opportunity to connect with our Danbury families. It's, it's been a lonely summer um, and a lonely spring not being able to see you here. I hope tonight, uh, I pray tonight that you feel reassured um, that you had your questions answered. I hope that you're excited um, about the opportunities that we have for our students and the opportunity to stay connected to each other. I think that that's so important during this time. Um, I thank you in advance for your support of our district, um, for your investment in our community and our kids. Again, if, if you have questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, if you have feedback in regards to tonight, what you liked or what you didn't like, don't hesitate to email me. And you know what? Let's take to social media and be excited. Be excited about the awesome things that are getting ready to take place in Danbury Schools because I believe we're ready to excel and to be the best. And I'm, I'm just so grateful to be a part of that with you. Again, thank you to our administrators and to our staff for the countless hours that they've put into helping us develop what we think is the very best possible options for our community and for our kids. Until I see you, have a wonderful evening. Give those kids hugs for me. Let's go Lakers.